Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Jesus City. Praise the Lord. Let's give God a hand clap of praise, for he is truly, truly worthy to be praised. Well, good morning. My name is Adam Jacobs, and I want to welcome you to Jesus City this morning. Uh, do we have any first-time worshipers here today? First time? Oh, praise the Lord. Nice to see you. Anyone else? God bless you. Thank you for visiting with us. Out of all the options uh, that you had to worship, you chose to worship with us at Jesus Cities, and we thank you, and we thank you those that are tuning in online as well. Feel free, if you're not in a hurry, those that are here for the first time, we want to give you a gift uh, that you can take along, and it looks something like this. There are shirts of many colors. It's not like Joseph with the coat of many colors, but there are many colors of shirts out there we want to give you as a thank you gift. So we want to know that you're welcome. We also want everyone to know that we're wanted. You are wanted and that you are definitely 100% loved. We welcome you. You're wanted here and we love you. And one thing we have today, we know we celebrated Easter last week. Did anyone enjoy Easter? Easter is one of my favorite favorite holidays. But one thing as believers, we know that the day that we designated Easter every year, once it has passed, you know what we can still celebrate? Easter, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that through whom we only have salvation and eternal life through. So don't let the calendar diminish Easter and how it has an effect on us. So we can still go around and ask people, well, how do you celebrate Easter? They say, well, Easter passed. No, well, how do you celebrate it today? Because we have an opportunity each and every day to, to wake up with uh, air in our lungs and words on our lips to celebrate and give thanks to God. Because what, what separates Christians from other faiths is that we serve the only true and living God. We serve a living God who intercedes on our behalf all the time. So that's something to be thankful for. So let's not let the calendar diminish the power of Easter and the power of salvation and the power of eternal life. So. I want to share that with you today. So as we all, let's stand to our feet, those that are able, and I'm going to open us up in prayer, and the next voice you will hear, thankfully, won't be mine in song. It will be my brother's in song, so let us pray. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we are so thankful and so grateful, one, that you were born on this earth. Not only that, that you grew you died on the cross, but you didn't stay dead. You died, was buried, and you were resurrected. And when you were resurrected, you overcame death. And since we have a relationship with you, we are overcomers as well. So, Lord, we just thank you. We give you praise and honor. And as we prepare to praise and worship you this morning, I pray, God, that you, Holy Spirit, that you would prepare our heart through the songs that we sing to prepare us for the word that will come from our pastor, Pastor Jason. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful day it is to celebrate our Lord and Savior here at Jesus City Church. And for you visiting here today, just to let you know, this is my second time here. So, uh, I'm right there with you. So, uh, you know, we just encourage you all. I love the love in this place. Uh, the people, they love each other, and you can tell that they love you being here, and they love me being here, and that makes me feel great, you know. And, uh, you know, but in the end, we pray that today that you leave this place knowing Jesus Christ better or knowing him for the first time. And so today, you know, I pray that you place your trust in him. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Yeah, born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. And what he did for me on Calvary is more than he knew, yeah. And I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail.
my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect submission and all is at rest. And I know the author of tomorrow's ordered my I praise in my risen King and Savior all the day long. So I trust in God, yeah, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Beautifully, I love it. Hey. And I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why. Trust him. That's why I trust him. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. You got to sing it again. Come on now. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. get you all on this stage and let me just step off. Wow. This next song is one that I brought, you know, to the table last time that I came just because I'm in awe of God's glory, of his creation, uh, of his people. And, uh, you know, you look around, you know, as Adam mentioned earlier, you know, today, new life, we have breath to be here today. That is evidence of the goodness of our God, amen? I mean, the trees outside, even these new buildings, the old buildings here in downtown Montgomery. Hey, listen, Lord, the Lord is good, and he is here with us this morning. So. All throughout my history, your faithfulness is walked beside me. 
The winter storms made way for spring In every season From where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life all over my life, yeah. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Lord, help me. Help me remember when I'm weak. The fear may come, but fear will leave. No, oh, you lead my heart to victory. Yeah, you are my strength, and you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. All over my life, yes, I do, God. I see your promises. All over my life, all over my life. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Oh, 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 I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. All over my life, yes, I do, God. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life. All over my life, yeah, yeah, sing that again. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life, yeah. And I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. We have nothing to fear. So why should I bear Oh, the evidence is here So why should I fear Oh, the evidence is here Amen. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my affairs are gone. I no longer I'm a child of God. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Yeah. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me, your love has called my name, I've been born again into your family, your blood flows through my veins, yeah. I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a 
child of God. I'm no longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Singing that again, no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And I am surrounded by the eyes. By songs of deliverance, we have been liberated from our bondage. We are the sons and the daughters. Yeah. Now let us sing our freedom. Make a joyful noise. God, we just say thank you so much that you, you are our Father and that you love us and we are your children, Lord. Thank you for that today. You did split the sea so we could walk right through, Lord. You have done the impossible in our life. And so today, God, we worship you and we thank you. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue, God, just to work in our life. Lord, we need more and more and more of you. And so we worship you now. We thank you for this morning and pray your blessing, God, on this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All agreed said amen. Amen. Hey, let's give it up for our friend this morning. Great job, Ryan. Hey, what a blessing. You know, Ryan was with us just a few weeks ago, and I'm just so thankful that he was able to join us for this morning. Hey, well, if you are brand new to Jesus City, we're so Glad you're here today. You know, generally this is what attendance looks like after Easter. You know, I said like the, the faithful few stay for week two. You know, that's generally what happens. But it's okay. I'm glad you're here. And uh, we just want to welcome you to Jesus City. My name's Jason. This is my lovely wife, Mary. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, well, we got some announcements for you, and then we'll get into our, our message today. You ladies had your prayer breakfast yesterday. We did, and it was such a sweet time. We had just a great time in prayer, fellowship, God's Word. It's always so powerful, and there's really no way to convey that unless you come. You've got to come. 
You know, the word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. But how can you taste and see if you don't come? Hey. So you got to come. So we'll have another one first Saturday of May. And it's actually going to be a little bit of a special one because we're having a baby shower prayer breakfast for one of our sweet, sweet girls here that's expecting uh, in, in June. But anyway... We have another exciting, exciting announcement, and I know you've been anxiously waiting for it, but this coming Monday night, tomorrow night, is, yes, is the start of our women's Bible study. And our dear Marilyn Chappelle, she is here this morning. She's right over there with her hand lifted. She is going to be taking all of you beautiful ladies through a 10-week study in Philippians. And you don't want to miss it. It is going to be incredible. There's going to be a study guide. It's going to be an amazing time. And all you have to do is just show up. And as Marilyn would say, 6 o'clock promptly. At, she's like me. She's on time. So 6 o'clock tomorrow night from 6 to 7.30 here at the church. Just bring yourself and bring your Bible. Because you're going to be getting into the Word with Marilyn. So invite a friend. Let us know you're coming. If you're planning on coming, please sign up at the information table after the service. And it's just going to be amazing time starting tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. That's awesome. Hey, well, a lot of different things that we have going on to help you get connected. You know, we've got like the ladies group. We have small groups that meet throughout the week. And so if you're looking for extra community, there's one tonight, you know, that meets at the Bonner House, and we've got one on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, and they're, they're, we've got a lot that happens at Jesus City. Even though we're a newer church, we try to create ways that you can be a part of the family of God to grow in your walk with the Lord. We even have one on Thursday nights, uh, you know, on base, and so there's one at the military base, uh, you know, which is, again, another opportunity for those of you that are in military, but all of that information is on our website. I don't know if you've had a chance to go to our website but you can get a lot of info. Stay up to date with what's happening at JesusCityChurch.com. And you can get, again, everything that's happening and also just what we're about as a church. You know, our church is really just about one thing. It's about Jesus. I know it comes as a shock, but his name's on the building. And that's really what it's about. We want you to know him and have your life changed by him. Uh, but with that being said, there are some things on your seat I want you to know about. There's a connect card and a pray card. And we want to connect with you. We want to get involved in your life. And that pray card, that's what the ladies prayed over yesterday. So when you fill those out, we really do pray over your needs. And in two weeks, we're going to have our men's prayer breakfast. And that's what we'll do. We'll pray over those needs as well. But with that, hey, we're going to jump right into our study this morning. And so would you open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 5? We've been going through the book of Matthew. And uh, we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so it takes a little bit of time, but we do get through it eventually. We are in a, a little segment called the Sermon on the Mount, which I think are some of the best bullet point, like one sentence messages that Jesus Christ gave that you could find anywhere. I mean, these are power packed and full of so much. And so today we're just looking at one of them. We're looking at verse seven. So the title of my message this morning is all about it. It was not too creative, but... Blessed are the merciful, all right? That is the title of the message this morning. Join me as we pray, and then we're going to ask that God would speak to our hearts. God, we thank you for this morning. We quiet our hearts. We ready our minds. We want to hear from you. Lord, we've worshiped you, and now, God, we want to hear from you. Lord, this is a, a characteristic that every Christian should have, that you are a merciful God, so we should be merciful people. Help us, Lord, exemplify mercy in a real way, to a hurting world around us. We thank you, Lord. We lift this to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want you to think about something. I want you to imagine if there were no such thing as, as hospitals. Imagine if you had a, a sickness that got real bad, but there was no urgent care. There was no emergency room. There was no professional health care available to you. Like, what would you do? Where would you go? I mean, imagine if the fever continued to climb and you couldn't, you know, go on WebMD any longer, you couldn't Google it, and you needed real help. Where would you go? Like, you, you had no place to go. It would just be a, man, prayer on your knees, which is always a great answer, but man, healthcare has been a true blessing that our world has enjoyed 
But imagine if you got a cut and an infection ensued, or if you fell and break a bone, or grandma broke her hip, or you know, you needed a surgery, or again, a disease became unmanageable at home. What would you do? Where would you go? Did you know that 95% of the world living in the first century had this same plight? Where there was no health care for the majority of those that were alive at that time, during the time of Jesus. Only 5% were wealthy enough to have a, a private, in-home, you know, physician that would come and, you know, give them advice or give them some of their bag of, of tricks. But for the majority of them, there was no hospital, no emergency shelters, no orphanages, no rescues, no clinics, no disaster relief foundations. There was nothing available. Even if we were to go back and look at life in the first century, which I was doing a lot of research this week, you know, the, the conditions were unparalleled. Today uh, is such a different time than it was back then. I was reading about children that were unwanted in the first century. It was said in Rome that if a child was unwanted, they would be left out in the elements. That, that a child would be left out, sometimes clothed, sometimes not clothed, just not desired, so not wanted and left out to die. Many female babies were set out to suffer and die. All handicapped children were left on their own to fend for themselves. And if just so happened one of them made it on their own, they would enter into adulthood and fend for life, you know, all on their own. I mean, could you imagine today that we would have really no wheelchairs and no, you know, care for those that have special needs, those that have handicaps? Today, we've got care and, and programs. We've got like just so many blessings for those that are the least of these. But in the first century, all that had diseases were made to live outside of the city. Those that had uh, no money, they were poor, they were looked down on. And you were actually looked down on if you assisted the poor in the first century. Children without parents would roam on their own. No orphanages existed. Nobody cared for these. And nobody cared if they lived or if they died. The Roman Empire life expectancy was between the ages of 22 and 33. Even I think about the Roman Colosseum. You know, the dignity of human life was a lot different back then than it is today. Today, we have regard for the sanctity of life. Your life is valuable. No matter if you've got abilities or disabilities, your life is valuable, made in the image of God. But back in the first century, in the Colosseum, there was much as 400,000 people that were brutally murdered as they battled the, the gladiators for the sake of sport. If you've watched the movies, they, they're thrown in the ring, whether they're slaves or whether they're poor or whether they're some type of criminal, they're thrown in there. And just for the sake of entertainment, they would sit there and watch them bite, battle to death. And they would throw in some lions and some bears and, and watch them rip each other apart. For the sake of entertainment, blood would be shed. There was no regard for human life. Especially this, women had no rights. But there was something that changed the course of human history. If this individual never came, it would be just like that today. There was a man who raised the bar on human dignity and the sanctity of life. Someone who had compassion on the sick. Someone who cared for the poor. Someone that cared for the diseased and the handicapped and the needy. Someone who showed mercy, mercy to the least of these. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the revolutionary. You see, Jesus Christ's ministry was a focus unlike anything that world had ever seen. If we were there in the first century, what Jesus was doing was, was mind-blowing. It was no just mere feat. It was something they had never experienced before. It was countercultural. It was radical. These actions, these behaviors was something that the world had yet to see. Jesus' earthly ministry was focused on the outcast. He went after the sidelined. Like, think about Jesus and who he went after. You remember him going after the poor and the homeless. The world would shun the poor, kick them out of the gates, but not Jesus. Jesus would go and find them. Jesus would minister to them. Jesus would go after the sick. When the lepers would be ostracized and put in a leper colony, don't you remember Jesus walking up and touching the leper? and healing the leper, doing what ought not to have been done. The woman that had the flow of blood that nobody wanted to be around, she would have to go around and yell unclean, but Jesus walks up. 
And Jesus engages her in conversation. Jesus draws close to the woman that's sick. The handicapped man that's born paralyzed from birth, Jesus had time for him. The thief on the cross, Jesus addressed. The prostitute that washed his feet. The adulteress that was caught in adultery itself. The outcast woman at the well, no other ladies wanted to hang out with her because she's got five husbands and living with her boyfriend. And so she's got a rumor she's been around, you know what I mean? And so nobody wanted to be with her. But Jesus goes and he engages her. He sits with her. He talks with her. It even takes the disciples by surprise that he's talking to this woman of ill repute. Jesus' ministry was unlike anything the world had ever seen. We take it for granted because we've come, you know, full circle and we look back and we're like, oh yeah, no big deal. We care about the lost. We care about the homeless. We care about those that have special needs. And, you know, we, we trumpet these people with their, their case and their situation and GoFundMe accounts. And, and we've got so much today that we're doing, but none of it would have happened if Jesus Christ would have not first set the stage for what God desired and what he asked his people to do. You see, Jesus started it, but it was the disciples and the early Christians that continued it. Matter of fact, in the early homes of these Christians, that's where the seeds of the ideas of all hospitals, shelters, orphanages, and convalescent homes were born and invented. Did you know this? The world can't take credit for it, but it was Christians who invented the hospital, who invented shelters, who invented orphanages, and convalescent homes. Christians are the ones that invented those. Could you imagine a world without those things? It's all because of the followers of Christ. Let me give you a little history on it to prove it. It was Christians in the first century that started caring for the the down and out. They would invite them into their homes. It was the Christians that were actually persecuted for their faith, if you remember. They were actually put in the Colosseum and they were there even by Nero. They were tortured to death and eaten alive. And, but it was Christians that were actually blessing their tormentors. There's accounts of Christians that were getting ready to be killed that were helping the gladiator that was about to kill them. Christians blessing them, giving mercy to them. It was in the 200s that a large plague broke out near uh, that, that eastern region and 5,000 people died a day. But guess who was going in and helping those that had the plague? Christians. Christians were raising money. They were the ones that were going in and offering support. They didn't run away when everybody got sick, but they were actually running in. In the 300s, it was when the first time that poor houses and leprosy houses were invented. It was Basil the Great in 350 AD that established the very first hospital. It was a 300-bed hospital where the sick were brought in and care was administered. But it wasn't until 394 AD that a wealthy follower named Fabiola who loved Jesus and had a radical conversion. She said, God has given me all of this wealth. I want to use it for the poor. She was able to build in Rome a 400-bed hospital, five wards, and for the first time in history, she made it free. Free for everybody. Anybody can come. We're going to clothe you. We're going to feed you. We're going to meet your needs. In addition, she used her country villa as the first convalescent home. So we've got history we look back on. Christians, what they started because of Christ, revolutionized the world. Today would look a lot different if it weren't for the Christians, if it weren't for Christ. Matter of fact, it didn't stop there, but it continued throughout history. Let me give you some names of people who believed that the sick were important, that the poor were important, that the diseased, the The handicapped were valuable. It's people like David Livingston, missionary doctor to the tribes of Zambia. It's people like Helen Rosevier, a missionary to Africa in the Congo to establish one of the first hospitals in Africa. Paul Brand was one of the first missionaries to the leper colonies in India, establishing a leper hospital. Klaus Dietscher John uh, was a doctor to the South Americas, the Incas. You've got Albert Schweitzer, Ida Scudder, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa in Calcutta with the with the, the poor, the worst of the worst, everybody neglected, the children. I think about Lottie Isabel Blake, the first black doctor missionary to Panama and to Jamaica. I think of, you know, lately because the blue angels have been flying over, it reminded me, you know, got all these planes flying over, but did you know about the ladies called the black angels? 
The black angels are a group of black ladies of the untold story of these black nurses in Staten Island who during the tuberculosis breakout during the 1920s, they were the first ones that volunteered, about 300 of them, volunteered their life to go in and minister to the poor in Staten Island. And so they called them the black angels. These ladies going in because of the love of Christ, putting their lives on the line. And they were actually the very first ones that started administering the tuberculosis actually vaccine was these ladies, the black angels. But I think of today, the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, Samaritan's Purse, all of these things can be traced back to one source, Jesus Christ. Could you imagine if none of that happened? Could you imagine if none of that existed, the millions, if not billions that received care because of what one man, the God man, put in place? But the question is this, why would we Christians be willing to do that? Like, why do Christians run into the plague and run into COVID and run into the the disaster relief? Why do we are the very first ones that go into horrible situations? Why do we do that? It's because of what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said this, when you help the poor, you help me. Jesus told his followers, when you clothe the naked, you're actually clothing him. When you assist the sick, you're assisting Jesus. When you visit the prisoner, you're visiting him. When you give a drink to the thirsty or food to the hungry, when you give shelter to the stranded, Matthew 25, verse 40, I'll put it on the screen. This is what Jesus says. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. This morning, I want you to get new contact lenses, new glasses, some new eyes. And here's my challenge. Did you know every single time you act in mercy towards somebody else that you're actually doing it to Jesus himself? If Jesus were outside right now and he came in and he was really hungry and it's actually Jesus and he walked up to you and was like, man, I'm really hungry. Would you give him a, a meal? Would you rake in the back and you would open some of the muffins and you're like, here, Jesus, you know, take him to lunch today. You'd probably bend over backwards to do something for Jesus. But Jesus elevates every, everyone around us. And he says, when you do it to the least of these, you're actually doing it to me. The reason why Christians are the most merciful people on the planet is because we recognize the most merciful God who's been merciful to us. And then we see in the faces of everybody around us our risen Savior, that every cup I give, I'm actually giving it to to Jesus. How good of eyes do you have to have that when you're clothing the naked, you're clothing Christ? This is the motivation of why me and you give mercy. The world is different Because of Jesus. The world today looks a lot different because of the Christians who followed their example in a beautiful way. And this is exactly, by the way, what the world should expect to see of us, right? I mean, they they come to you and they expect you to act like Jesus. It's definitely a sad thing when you see a Christian who's not like Christ, right? Isn't that a bummer? Like, it's fine if you wear the football jersey and you don't know nothing about the team. That's fine, whatever. You can be a bandwagon fan, that's fine. But it is a real shame when someone says, I'm a Christian, but they look nothing like Christ. Christians, we're to model Jesus to the world around us. Matter of fact, this merciful God, His mercy should flow to us and flow through us. That's the way that it should work. Where we sit and admire an amazing God And we, overfilled like a cup to the brim, we can't wait to give the mercy to the world that he has given to us. This morning, what I want you to see is that there are great blessings that will come your way if you decide to live a merciful life. Jesus says it this way in verse 7 of Matthew 5, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's try it again. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. 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 There it is. Yeah, we're going to stay awake in church. And so I'm, I'm glad you're here today. Um, the merciful will receive something. You're going to get mercy. The question though is this, what is mercy? 
What's mercy? And I, I hope to define it for you today and give you some very practical tips on how to exemplify it in your life. You know, mercy is not just what I did when I was younger. You know, I had an older brother and a little brother, and we would play that game where you interlock fingers. If you played that game and you, you start twisting each other's hands and you have to wait because somebody has to cry for, for mercy in order for you to stop, you know, you'd be on your knees and be like, mercy, mercy, mercy. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. That's what it means. Mercy. Now, that's the exact opposite of justice, by the way. When we want justice done, you know, the definition of justice is getting what you deserve. It reminds me of that older lady that got her picture taken by a professional photographer. And, you know, he took her picture and he printed it out. It was a Polaroid. Remember those? And it came across and she was waiting for it to develop. And as she looked at it, she got a real look of concern across her face. Like, this, this isn't right. He's like, ma'am, what's wrong? She's like, this picture doesn't do me justice. He said, ma'am, you don't need justice. You need mercy. <laughs> what is mercy? Mercy can be defined in two different ways. Mercy is compassion shown to someone or it's forgiveness given towards someone. It's two things that you do with your hands. Mercy, it's what you do with your hands. Mercy is something that you pick up and you, you give to somebody. So it's things that you would help with. I wrote it here, what you pick up to help. So this is compassion. I want to do something with my hands to help you. Show great love to you. And so I'm going to step toward you. Make room for you. Meet a need in your life. That is what I pick up. But also there's a, another side of mercy. Where it's not just a physical, but it is a spiritual. It's not just an external, but it's an internal where I'm not picking up, but I'm letting go. There's another aspect of mercy that deals with forgiveness, where you give someone what they don't deserve. You let go to heal. You let go of the bitterness, of the grudge. You let go of the wounds. You let go of all the things that have come your way to heal. The mercy of God that fills your heart should begin to flow through your hands today in what you pick up and what you let go. One of the, actually one of the great evidences of someone being saved is that what has flowed into your heart begins to flow out of your hands. You know, if any moment you've got a hose and you go to turn your hose on and you run over to where the hose is at and nothing's coming out, you realize, well, the spigot's on. Okay, so I know that part's right. But somewhere along the line, there's a, there's a kink in the line, Right? And so you've got to trace it all the way back, you know, unwind that thing. And then it'll start to flow. And sadly, in the life of so many Christians, oh, they're quick to receive from God. Like, oh, I'll take all the mercy, God. I'll take it, you know. Like, new mercies every morning. Yes, please, you know. But there's a kink in your line because you're not pouring out. And you will begin to stagnate. And that will be great condemnation against you that you were so willing to take, but not willing to give. Matter of fact, 1 John 3, 17, he says it like this. If anyone has the world's good and sees a brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does even the love of God abide in him? So John questions your salvation. He's like, man, you're not even saved. That you would just be so selfish to take and not be willing to give. God gives to you and expects it to get through you. And that is a great evidence of our salvation. But biblically speaking, we understand mercy, mercy because we have a merciful God. So when I talk about the topic of mercy, I'm, I'm really dealing with, with God, that we've got an amazing God who on the cross gave us what we don't deserve, right? Like truthfully, God can never be more merciful to, to you than what he's already been by sending his son to die on the cross for you. Like at the cross, we see the justice and the mercy of God Kiss here at the cross, right? He got justice so I could get mercy, right? The only reason God could be merciful towards you is because he, was, he gave justice to his son. And so this is what we first sit back and look at, that I understand mercy because God's been merciful to me. Oh, he's given me what I don't deserve. He's given me compassion. He's given me forgiveness. What a wonderful God that we have. And this is why Christians should be the most merciful people. Because you've got the most merciful God. We're held to a higher standard, family. 
And that is a, a warning, by the way, because it's a really a sad thing, as I said, when there is a kink in the line and when somebody is willing to receive, but they're not willing to give. When you want all the mercy, but you're very slow to give it out. You know, there are some Christians that I know that they are the type that they want their pound of flesh. Even here in the church, you know, at Jesus City, they're like, no, no, we need to set the record straight, Pastor. We need to do this here. We need to have a meeting. No, no, we need to rebuke them. We need to rebuke them right to their face. We need to call them out. Church discipline right now. It's like, well, I don't know. I don't know. There's a time for that. But James says this. James 2.13, he says, For judgment is without mercy to those who show no mercy. The New Living says there will be no mercy for those who have shown no mercy to others. Is that a scary thing that, that God would look at your, your level of mercy that you allow to flow out of your life? And he says, I, I'll be just as merciful to you as you've been to, to them. What would it look like today? He who shows no mercy destroys the bridge over which he himself must pass. Mercy is an important ingredient. But what I want to get to right now is, is not just talking about mercy, but showing you how to be a merciful believer. Jesus gave two parables, and we're going to look at both of those today, on these two categories, on how to pick up and how to help somebody. He gives a really great parable of the, the Good Samaritan. And then he gives a really great parable of a man that was forgiven a large debt on how to let go, the mercy of forgiveness. The first one is going to be what you pick up. Mercy that meets needs. Are you a merciful Christian? When you see a need around you, are you quick to meet that need? Or are you like, well, these other individuals in the parable that Jesus gave, Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 30, this is what Jesus said about showing mercy in a compassionate way. Starting in verse 30, it says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, man, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a little bit later, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Jesus asked this man, which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the young man said, the one who showed him mercy, mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. The story of the Good Samaritan is only five verses long, but man, it is jam-packed with a lesson for me and you on, on what a Christian should be doing today. Compassion. Mercy that helps. What you pick up and what you're willing to do. Now, Jesus gives a strong rebuke to the people that should be doing something and they're not. He starts out by you know, putting on blast the priest. Did you notice that? So this is the pastor. Imagine if we put it today that you're on the west side of Montgomery in a not too good area. And as you're passing by, some dude gets jumped. Okay. He gets shanked. And so he's left there bleeding out about to die. And a pastor comes driving by in his truck and a pastor comes to a stop and he sees this guy bleeding out on the west side of Montgomery. It's dark. It's after hours. It's a sketchy spot, but the pastor sees him, makes eye contact and he drives away. Jesus is simply saying that there's a lot of people that are men of the cloth that claim to be in ministry, but they're wolves in sheep's clothing. And sadly, it's that way today. But he doesn't just call out the priest, he calls out the, the churchgoer. The Levite was somebody that frequented into the temple. These are people that worked in the temple. It's, it's you, it's you, you know, you faithful few that, you know, you're here the week after Easter. 
You know, you come like rain, sleet, or snow, church must go. You know what I mean? Like you're here, you've got your seat, you're always, you're serving, you're a blessing, you're a Levite, you're in God's house. So a Levite, a churchgoer, Jesus City family members on the west side of Montgomery, and they see some dude get all beat up, and they pull up, they watch the whole thing, and oh my, what am I going to do? And you know, and you feel a little bit of guilt, and a little bit of like, I should jump out there, I should help, I should, you know, throw a knife at him or something, and, uh, but then you don't. You pull ahead, and maybe somebody else will help them, and you, you leave. Jesus calls out the churchgoer, the Levite. He says, no, no, the people that should be doing something, they're not doing anything. But there's a guy, a Samaritan. This is like a put down. Matter of fact, they would make fun of Jews by calling them Samaritans. They made fun of Jesus calling him a Samaritan. So this was like, you know, a, a pagan, a heathen, a non-church going, just your average dude out there living his life. He comes across this circumstance, and what does he do? Is he comes up to the guy, jumps out of his vehicle, there on the west side of Montgomery, and he pulls out his little emergency kit, puts his band-aids on him, calls an ambulance. He waits for the ambulance to show up, looking around for the robbers, what's going to happen? He gets in the ambulance with the guy, rides over to Baptist South, sits at Baptist South, tells the, the people, you know, oh, well, uh, what's his information? What's his name? Yeah, 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 this is his information. You give them your name. Put this on, on my insurance. I'm going to take the bill. I'm going to come back. You leave. You come back. You sit by the bedside because he's unconscious. When he wakes up, you're there. The first face that he sees. Jesus gives a completely different picture here of what compassion looks like in the life of the Christian. And what he says is an indictment against every Christian. He says, sadly, the world is doing more than the church. This is our job. Our job is to, is to exemplify Jesus to the world. It's our job. But it's not even a job, to be honest, because if the president of the United States called your cell phone today and said, hey, I'm going to be in town. Do you think you can actually, I just need a little bit of water. Can you bring me a bottle of water? It doesn't matter your views of the man. If the president called you, you would be like, hey, this isn't a service. This is a blessing. You know, like this is an, it's an honor that I get to serve the president. But when we come to Jesus and he tells us to do something, why do we call it service? Like, oh, I got to serve the Lord today. Like, no, no, no. It's an honor that the king of the universe would have you do anything for him. And he's saying, when you do it to them, you do it for me. Not only are you doing it for me, but you're doing it to me. And so Jesus says, this is what compassion, mercy looks like. You have hands that are meant to look like the hands of Jesus. He gave you feet so you would use those feet in a way that he would use his feet. Our job as believers is to show the world what Jesus is like. Mercy. Mercy in action. Here are some things that you could be doing to show mercy. One, you could be feeding the hungry. When's the last time that you gave a meal to those that were hungry? You could give a drink to the thirsty. You could buy some clothes and clothe the homeless. You know... Here at Jesus City, we've got a lot of friends that live out on the streets. And so it's a common thing that we'll have them come in our building and be here. And, and it's always a fun thing when I see them wearing new clothes. And I'm like, hey, man, I like the new digs, bro. You know, like your shirt, your pants. And it's either, oh, I got it over at LaDonna's ministry. Or somebody pulled over and gave me a new shirt or gave me some new clothes. And, and it's a blessing, the joy that comes on their face that they're not walking around in rags. Do you not realize you're clothing Jesus when you do that? Or you buy a blanket and you give it to the cold or you help them find shelter. When's the last time that you visited a prison or you wrote to an inmate? Jesus says, when you visit them, you visit me. When you comfort the sick, there's a lot of people at Baptist South, Baptist East, over at Jackson that are just begging for someone to sit by their bedside to pray for them. One of my favorite ministries back in California was I was a pastor over 18 different convalescent homes. And we would go in those convalescent homes and we would sing them Christmas carols and we would bring them little gifts. And those people that the world has put away, hiring someone else to care for them, many of them feel forgotten, but you go in there and you, you show them mercy. You show them a little kindness. I believe that mercy in this way could change a person more than you could ever recognize. Case in point, my wife is really, really good at this. There was a man, his name was Chester. 
And my parents, you know, back in California, we lived near March Air Force Base. And near March Air Force Base, my parents lived there. There was a man that lived on a corner. And he was a grumpy old man, you know, like everybody knew him as the grumpy man. And he had got a dog that would bark at the gate, so you couldn't go near him. And nobody really knew his story, know nothing about him. You pull up, and he'd be like, ah, 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 ah. you know, just kind of point and grunt, you know, like, oh, yeah, don't, don't pay attention to Chester over there. Um, and that was kind of the reputation. But one day, my wife, she decides, she pulls up, and she gets out, and he comes, you know, dog starts barking, rah, 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 and he's like, ah, 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 and gets all grumpy at her. And she wasn't very successful the first time, but I do remember her coming home and saying, Jay, I tried to stop and talk to Chester, and it didn't go too well, but I, I noticed that his shoes, his shoes were really worn thin. You mind if I get him some shoes? Get him some shoes, baby. So she buys the shoes, and she goes back, and she goes up to the gate, and it's still the grumpy, rah, 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 you know, like, and she's like, no, 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 she hangs the shoes on the on the fence. And a little bone for the dog. His name's King, right? <laughs> he takes them. She leaves. She notices that there are needs going on at the house. Soon something begins to happen. Is that hardened heart, the man that wants nothing to do with God. Can I pray for you? No, I'm not into God. You know, you know, he's been over at March Air Force Base for 30 plus years as a cook, you know, like working behind the scenes, never married, no family, nobody cared about him, nobody's interested in him, but, but my wife, Get in some shoes, get in little clothes, you know. Oh, let me fix your walker with a little like tennis balls on the walker. And, you know, he, he didn't have an air conditioning in the house. He had a swamp cooler. And so when he would sit outside in the heat, he would spray his tree with the hose and let it drip on him in the hot, you know, in the heat. But he needed a new hose. And so I believe we got a new hose. And then I'm out there mowing soon enough, you know, mowing his yard. And my wife is in there painting his house and she gets inside now. She's washing his dishes. She's buying him groceries. She, putting up handrails. She's ministering. And then sooner or later, what do I see? The man that was hard and that wanted nothing to do with God, that nobody cared for, I see him bowing his head with my wife to ask Jesus Christ to come into his life and forgive him of his sins. Great mercy won over a hardened heart. You never know how far just a, a new pair of shoes could go. And Chester entered eternity about a, a year ago. But it was little acts of mercy that went a long way. I believe that you're to be generous to strangers. When you see a need, you're supposed to meet it. God puts needs in front of you so you can meet it. Something my dad taught me that I'm very thankful for my dad, you know, was a, a military man, hard in some areas, but he was a very generous man. I can give him this. And I remember several times that my dad would prepare to be generous toward people. What my dad would do is he would have his wallet, and he would have in his wallet folded up either like a $20 bill. Sometimes he'd have like a $100 bill, which was a sacrifice to do. But what he did was he was prepared to be a blessing toward other people. Where he, he told God, you know, I'm going to put this here. And whenever you want me to give this money away, God, you just put it in my heart and I'll give it away. And he called it the blessing account. And I find it interesting that today so many Christians are like, oh man, hey, you know, you can ask for something. There's a need that pops up. You're like, oh, I, I need to go to the ATM. I don't got nothing on me. You know, like what are the chances? You know, like, oh, yeah, sorry, bro. Don't got nothing. If you actually prepared to be merciful and you planned on being generous, I think things could go a lot different in your life. Even today, I, I have tried to replicate what my dad does and I always keep money on me just so I could give it out. It's not my idea, it was his idea, but I'm challenging you, Jesus City, that you should be the most merciful, gracious, generous people in Montgomery. And there's no telling how many Chesters could be changed just by a, a simple act. Mercy meets needs and it makes room for others. That's the first area. Mercy, mercy that picks up and helps other people. But now there's the second category as we kind of wrap up our sermon this morning. It's a, a mercy that lets go. It's a mercy that's spiritual and internal. You see, real mercy receives wrongs and clears shame. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says it this way. It was Peter that asked him one day. Peter walks up to Jesus and says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? And Peter thinks he's being smart. He's like, seven times, you know? And he gets corrected, and Jesus is like, bro, seven times 70? 
And then he gives them a story. There was a king, kingdom of heaven, and it can be compared to a king who decided to bring accounts up to date with servants, verse 23, that had borrowed some money from him. In the process, one of his debtors who brought in, who owed him millions of dollars, he couldn't pay it. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything that he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and he begged him, please, please be patient with me. I'll pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him. And he released him and forgave him of the debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars and he grabbed him by the throat and he demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him just for a little more time. Be patient with me. I'll pay it. I'll pay it, please. He pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. And when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called the man that he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you. Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. Verse 35, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. There is a second area of mercy that cuts a little deeper And it deals with forgiveness. Mercy is a letting go of what you've been hanging on to. Real Christians are those that bear wrongs patiently. Real Christians are those that forgive wrongs willingly. Even allowing yourself to be defrauded and wronged. Like I think about 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It was Paul the apostle talking about how Christians are suing each other in the church. And he was real upset because, you know, they're like, no, this is mine and this is yours. And they were fighting and suing each other. It was a mess. First Corinthians chapter six, he says this, why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourself be cheated? Like when's the last time you heard that preached, right? Right now on social media, it's like, no, you better get your own and stand up for yourself. And, you know, like you are strong and People need to bow to you and forget those other people. It's like, ah, let's go back to the Bible. How about you be cheated? Willingly. Let yourself be ripped off. That's what it's saying. Instead, verse 8, instead you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. Mercy is the ability to suffer wrong and not view it as suffering. I see this as a great need in our church. Our church. It's amazing to me that so many folks are the quickest to demand justice and the slowest to demand mercy or give mercy. It even comes to why people leave the church. It's funny. As a pastor, I hear all the reasons why people are quick to leave the church. And they leave church for the, like the smallest of reasons, you know? Like someone says something to you and you get offended. You're like, I'm out of here. I'm done. How dare they? She's too bossy. I I can't believe she's a leader in the church. And the way that she, you know, talks to me and the way that she texts me and the things that have been said and and, and how dare she and she's moody and she forgot my birthday. I bought her a present. She didn't buy me a present. I'm going to another church. You know, I, uh, she made a comment about my child. He's rude. He's grumpy. He's not exemplifying the love of Christ. He's too loud. Bill, where's Bill at? I love Bill. He's too forward. He's too weird. He's this. You name the the complaints. That is not the way church is meant to be. Get over the wounds that aren't even that bad. We don't even need Satan to attack our church because you're doing his work for him. Right? Right? Like causing division, talking behind each other's backs, like, oh, how dare she? And it's like, get over it. Be merciful. Be merciful. Willingly suffer loss. Mercy is sometimes letting go of the offense and forgiving, not holding the grudge, not causing division. There are times, again, 
that this is the most important action that you can make for the sake of unity inside the church. Mercy is letting go. And some of you really do need to let go. Let it go. Model your Jesus in a beautiful way and just, just let it go. Mercy is forgiving. It's not shaming mistakes. It's giving kindness for rudeness. It's holding your tongue when they're lashing out on you. Mercy. What a beautiful thing mercy is. And again, I believe that mercy has a way of changing hearts unlike anything else. That when it looks like justice is the answer and you give mercy, it goes a long way. I'll give you one example as we wrap it up. At our door, when you exit, you're going to see at the double doors, I want you to look at the light switch. Okay, it's just one single light switch. On that light switch, you're going to see like $5 worth of quarters that are stacked up on that, that light switch. Now, you've probably never noticed it, but it's there. It's always been there. And what's the reason? Here's the reason why. Every Friday, we invite all of our homeless friends, all of our people off the street to come in our church and clean. Over the past months, we've had a lot of things that have gone missing, okay? Like microphones go missing and iPads go missing. A purse went missing. A cell phone went missing. My laptop went missing. You know, like I'm like, man, I've got tracking on it. So I tracked it and went and got it back. You know, I'm like, come on, bro. Um, so then I started thinking, you know, like, how about we create a way, and this is all the Lord, a way to give them an opportunity to take, but then to do what's right. And so I put out a stack of quarters and I put a camera on it. So when you see it, when you exit, you'll see what I'm talking about. And this is what happens. It's purposely put there just for my thieves. Just so my thieves can have something. It's just like low hanging fruit. They can take it and act like they didn't got it. This is what we do. A few weeks ago, I had somebody come in, the quarters were missing and I just go to my cell phone. I go to the video footage and I'm like, oh, I see him, I see him. So this is what we do. So I walk over and it's generally just me. I walk over and say, hey, my man, man, this is God's house right here. This is God's house. Everything in here belongs to the Lord. And I view everything from the chairs to the, the carpet, to even some little quarters, you know, that are on like this. There was a little sack of quarters that I had. I just want to ask, have you seen my quarters? And you start seeing like, you know, like, oh man, you know, like he starts moving around, you know, like, oh man, you're going to call the cops. You're going to call the cops, man. I can't go back to prison. I can't go back to jail. I can't even call the cops. Oh man. Like he starts getting sweating and probably he's, like, he's thinking I'm going to give him justice. Justice. I say, how about this? If you give me back the quarters, I'll do something special for you. All right. So he pulls out the quarters, gives them to me. And I said, now open your hand, and I give them back. You wanted them. I want to bless you with them. I'm not going to call the cops. Rather, what I'm going to do is say this. The Lord loves you. God often gives us what we don't deserve. He blesses us even when we, oh, when we do wrong. My friend, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want to, I want to recommission you in a new way, you know? Because I said, here's the video footage of you doing it. You can see yourself. He's like, oh, man, I, yeah, that's right. And I'm not going to tell anybody. We're going to keep it between us. But I'm going to ask that you would help me look out for the quarters in the future. He's like, all right. So like almost every week, he'll come up to me and be like, hey, Pastor Jay, Pastor Jay. Hey, somebody took two quarters, you know? I'm like, I got them, dog. Don't worry. I got them on the camera, you know? Um, but what ended up happening is this individual went from being on the outside to now being on the inside for what reason? Because of mercy. Mercy. Giving people what they don't deserve. And why is this so heart moving? Because that's what God did to win you. Is it not? Would you not be here if it weren't for God that didn't give you what you deserve? You didn't take a roll of quarters. But you've broken every commandment. You didn't try to just take something from the church, but you, you took something much deeper. You wounded him much greater. The things you've said, the things that you've done, the places you've gone, you said you wouldn't, but you did. Years upon years upon years of disobedience to God. But he's never once done what? Given you justice. He's given you mercy. He comes to you and he, with his hands, gives you, blesses you, helps you. And then he doesn't, he opens, he gives you forgiveness and kindness and more chances and more chances. All I'm saying today is this, blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. I close with this one little principle that I think is hidden within the text. Here in the text, if you want to receive mercy, you got to be merciful. 
Proverbs 11.25 says this, he who waters will himself be watered. Today, if you're feeling a lack in your life, you're like, man, I, I'm in need. If you're not receiving something in your life, it's a direct correlation to what you're not giving. Today, you're like, man, I really need to be encouraged. I come in this place and I need encouragement. Then I'm gonna tell you, go give somebody encouragement. If you need it, why don't you go give it? Because the Bible says very clearly, when you are merciful, you will receive back on yourself. And this is like, it, it, it's a hose pointed back at you. When you're merciful, you get mercy. When you go to encourage, you get encouragement. I need love, then go love somebody else. I need recognition, go recognize somebody else. I need to be cared for, go care for somebody else. I want mercy then be merciful to someone else. It's an amazing principle we have before us today, that the merciful receive mercy. With hands that, that pick up and help, that's what we do. All history points to Christians that were willing to give compassion, that were willing to serve, willing to help the needy and the down and out. They were able to pick up and help. All of history's changed because of those believers. But also, not only them, but you today, your life is changed, not only when you help, but when you let go. When you give mercy to the people around you. There's great freedom in that, in forgiveness. And I challenge you, family, would you do it today? Let me close in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for today. God, today, I just pray that you would push these truths deep within our hearts. We look to you and we say, thank you, God, that you've been so merciful to us. Oh, Lord, I've done nothing but the wrong things. And you've done nothing but give me the best thing. You are a merciful God. I pray you'd help me be a merciful follower. Lord, I pray for all my friends today that you would give them new eyes to see that when they help somebody in need, they help you. When they forgive somebody, Lord, they're doing it to you. God, I pray that you would break the bonds and the, the chains, Lord, that are holding us back from this. We love you. We thank you. And I just pray your blessing, Lord, over our day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would stand with me. Just worship him one more time. When I cannot feel And my wounds won't heal Lord, I humbly kneel Hidden in you Lord, you are my life so I don't mind to die Just as long as I am hidden in you If I could just sit with you a while If you could just hold me Nothing can touch me Though I'm wounded, though I die If I could just sit with you a while If you could just hold me Moment by moment Till forever passes by We're going to repeat that whole thing when I cannot feel And my wounds won't heal Lord, I humbly kneel Hidden in you Lord, you are my life So I don't mind to die just as long as I am hidden in you. Yeah, if I 
I could just sit with you, if I could just sit with you a while, yeah. if you could just hold me, nothing can touch me, though I'm wounded, though I die, if I could just sit with you a while. If you could just hold me Moment by moment Till forever passes by Sing it moment by moment Moment by moment Till forever passes by Moment by moment Moment by moment Till forever passes by. Let's praise him this morning. Amen. You are dismissed.